Okay. Typogra typographic anatomy, learning the lexicon. So everything starts on a baseline grid. When we start um, aligning our letter forms, we align them on the baseline grid. Now, sometimes we might design them and take them off the baseline grid for design purposes, but the first line that we lay, lay our letters on is called the baseline grid. The next line is the median. The median line is where all of the lowercase letters, um, the height of the lowercase letters line up to. The space between the median line and the baseline, we refer to as X height. And that's gonna come in real handy to talk about when we talk about different typefaces. Different typefaces may be the same size, but they will all have different X heights. <clears throat> and this is what we mean when we're referring to X height. I want you to pay close attention. Notice how the rounded letters are coming a little above and a little below the median line and the baseline. Notice how they just scooch just a little bit over and up and around. But then if you notice the letter I over here, it lines perfectly up. And that is because we, we look at uh, letter forms optically. And if the O and the C were shrunk down a little, so just the edges, the top little edges of them were hitting that line, optically, there wouldn't be enough black of the stroke so that it would feel like the letters were too small. So in order for the rounded letters to feel that they are the same height as the straight edged letters, they have to slightly go above and below the baseline and the median line. The next line in our scaffolding is called a cap height. And as I said, um, even though these three examples are all the same point size, their heights are different. So you can see the sans serif H and X on the left are aligning to, that's their cap height and their X height. But if we took a sans serif X and H and laid it right next to these two, you would notice they have different X heights. They're the same point size, but they don't match up because we don't measure typefaces by height. So what we do is we measure typefaces and type elements with points and picas. Picas are generally used to measure page elements and dimensions such as column widths and page margins. Points, you already know, because you all have been working on computers for years, all fonts are, are listed in points. So you've already are kind of comfortable using, understanding point sizes are how we talk about typefaces. But we also talk about the spacing, and uh, rules and um, any kind of small indents and, and letters and spacing elements, everything is, is in points. Picas are what we use on a page layout for what column widths and page margins. Um, we don't use inches. And so hence why you needed a type gauge ruler because you'll notice on your type gauge ruler, your measurements are listed in points and picas. Yes, there's still at inches because there are some elements we still might measure in inches, but you need all three. So we have, uh, understand there's two different categories. There's sans serif and serif. Serifs are the little decorative elements that come off the edges of the strokes and the stems of the letters. Sans serif have no decorative elements. We refer to the drawing of the letter, all lines that define the basic letter form as strokes. So whenever we're referring to any part of a letter, we're referring to the stroke of the letter. And of course we know the serifs are those small elements that are added to the end of the main strokes of a letter form. The space between the stem and the serif is called a bracket. And it's a curved line that kind of transitions from the stem to the, to the serif. Anything that falls below the baseline 
is referred to as a descender. It's a stroke on a lowercase letter that falls below the baseline. Anything that comes above the cap height is an ascender. And that's a stroke on a lowercase letter that rises above the median X height and cap and cap height. A curved stroke enclosing the counterform of a letter we refer to as a bowl. And a bowl is only on enclosed letter forms. So a G or an O would have a bowl. The space in the center, that negative space in the center of a letter form is referred to as a counter. This is a stem, which is the major vertical or diagonal stroke in a letter form. Anyone can tell me what this is? We talked a little bit about it last week. A ligature? Yes, it's a ligature. And it's the most common type of ligature. It is where um, two or more characters are linked together as one unit, such as F and I. This is one of the most common. And what would we call this part at the very top of the F? We refer to that as a finial. It's the rounded non serif terminal to a stroke. And a terminal is a self-contained finish of a stroke without a serif. So if it's rounded, it's a finial. If it's not, it's just a terminal. And then you have these kind of um, additional forms of, of referring to um, terminals, a tail, a Q has a tail. So the curved or diagonal stroke at the finish of certain terminals is a tail. Only Qs have tails, no other letter form has a tail. Cross stroke is the horizontal stroke that intersects the stem. So letter T, letter F. And this is a spur the extension that articulates the meaning of a curved and a rectilinear stroke. Think of like a spur on the back of a cowboy boot. Now the N, letter N and the letter M have shoulders, curved strokes that are not a bowl. In other words, they are not completely enclosed. So we refer to them as shoulder. And we're entering into a part of the anatomy that is very familiar um, if we think back to our history of Jeffrey Torrey, and he was using um, the, the human anatomy to kind of identify the perfect foundation of letter forms. Well, we're gonna notice now as we move into more of this anatomy that it's going to have a lot of in common with human anatomy. So this is referred to as a shoulder. G's, lowercase g's have the ears. We refer to the little, element of the stroke that comes off the G as an ear. So if we're continuing with our, our um, mirroring human anatomy, what would you call the upper strokes of a Y or capital F? What do you think they're called? Any ideas? Maybe limbs or arms. Arm, there you go, arm. The short strokes off the letter forms on the, or either they're horizontal or inclined up where on the upper part of the letter are arms. And if those are arms, what would this lower limb be? <laughs> leg. That's right. This is a leg, short strokes off the letter form, either at the bottom or inclined downwards. So think of like the letter, capital K, capital R. This is a crossbar, horizontal strokes that joins two stems. So you have the crossbar is joining two stems, a cross stroke is what the F has, meaning it's just coming off the stem. 
So capital A's and, and uh, capital V's have apex and vertex. The points created by joining two diagonal stems, apex are above and vertex are below. And the space, uh, the interior space where two strokes meet is the crotch. Now we learned in our um, understanding of, of typefaces and the development of typefaces that strokes that have a thin to thick um, design have a stress in the O. So what a stress is, is the gradual variation in the thickness of a curved character or part of a stroke. So the ones that are vertical would be in the modern category. Ones that are diagonal are in the old um, style, excuse me, category. And you can see here, there's one with none because this does not have a thin to thick difference. This is a perfectly equal stroke all the way around. So there's no stress. All right, so this is the part that's gonna be much more participatory. We're gonna talk about classifications. So last week we learned about the history of typefaces. So this is, let's see how much we remember. So old style, capitals influenced by curved or carved, sorry, carved Roman at capitals emulates classic calligraphy. The weights of stress are rounded forms are at an angle as in handwriting. Bracketed serifs, top serifs are at an angle. It's human-like. What typeface did we learn is now gone through decades of being one of the most popular typefaces used in movie posters? That falls in the old style category. Who can tell me? Was it Helvetica? Nope. Set. Movie posters. It was the Roman something. What was it? Uh, Who can remember? Who can help? You can phone a friend, Tim. Phone a friend. <laughs> Who can help him? Who has their notes handy? We saw a whole little box video on it. It is the most popular video, I mean, a uh, typeface on, for decades on movie posters. It went from the big movies down to now it's the horror movie typeface. Which one is it? Anyone? It's Roman, it's definitely Roman. And it was carved into a column in Rome. What column was it carved in? The typeface is named after that famous column. Who knows their Roman history? Anyone gonna help Tim out? Is it, uh, is it Trajan? <gasps> Who said that? Who said Trajan? Stephanie. Stephanie, ding, 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 it ding, ding. It took me a while to go back through my notes, but I, I could picture it. I just couldn't remember the name. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Trajan, absolutely, Trajan. All right, let's see how we do on the next one. <laughs> Modern, extreme contrast between thick and thin strokes. More mechanical, less calligraphic. Unbracketed serifs. The weight of the stress of round characters is vertical thin, straight serifs. It was said that when this typeface was introduced, it was blinding people. What typeface, when it was introduced, was blinding people? Who remembers? Was that Baskerville? Yes, ding, 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 ding. Is that Ra Raj? Yep. All right, good job, Baskerville. All right, here's the next one, Egyptian. 
aka slab serifs. Heavy square or rectangular serifs, minimal stress of curved strokes. Some have strokes that are the same weight. Some are unbracketed. Who can tell me why Egyptian or slab serif typefaces were created? There was something that changed in the world and all of a sudden this type of typeface was needed. Why? It's 1845. What was going on? Why do we need these typefaces? Cans. Continue your thought. That, so that was the end of the thought. <laughs> Cans. What did we have? What do you, Noel? What were they doing? What were? What was? What does that mean? Smaller printing. Printing. printing? What were you saying, Nathan? Smaller printing. No. Larger. The industrial, <laughs> the industrial revolution was happening. And yes, we were putting our products in cans, but how did we know what to buy? What was being pasted all over the city? Labels. No, wait. <laughs> Billboards. Billboards. <laughs> Billboards were being pasted all over the city. Billboards. It was the first time we had to go big big, heavy, square serifs. We had to go big. That's why Egyptian fonts, heavy slab serifs were designed for billboards going big. All right, guys, I know you guys can do this one. We're getting, this is Futura. We're now in the 1920s uh, when uh, Futura came around. No serifs, O's are perfect circles. A and M have sharp peaks. They're very geometric rhythm. In 2000, a typeface was designed in New York by Tobaris Ferrer Jones. And it was based on designs that he found in New York by the Port Authority. This typeface was referred to as the first family of type. Who can tell me what typeface I'm talking about? Gotham. Yes, Gotham, Doc. Good job, Steph. Gotham. I remember that one because my dog's name is Tobias and in our book it has a couple fonts by that that same guy that have Tobias as they catch my attention. <laughs> there you go Tobias Brewer Jones. Awesome. All right guys here's we're going to wrap it up strong. I want us to keep going. I know we're going to get this one transitional sans no serif anonymous or neutral rational uniform stroke Stress is almost always vertical, super friendly, super comfortable. The typeface that I'm going to, uh, that um, there's a typeface that is a transitional sans that is so famous, it has its own movie. Who can tell me what typeface has its own movie? It's that famous. Helvetica. Helvetica. There we go. <laughs> Excellent. Helvetica, that's it. Excellent, good job, everybody. So this is not all the typefaces uh, categories that there are. This is a kind of very broad stroke um, example of, of typefaces. Uh, there are many, many, many more categories. Um, there are books that are like, like encyclopedia size, right? Big, thick books that can classify this into minute detail. But these are like kind of the biggies. This is like an intro level. Like these are the five biggies classifications. And then they can kind of narrow down even further beyond this. So I don't want you to think this is the end all be all, but this is kind of a good, a good starting point of understanding type classifications. Um, why, why do we need to know type classification? Why can that be helpful? Who could tell me? Why do you think that matters? Any ideas? Anything, what do you think? Part of our reading kind of touched on it. 
idea of pairing typefaces. You know, as a designer, you're choosing typefaces. Couple things. You can, the, when you know the history of a typeface, you have the ability to understand the, what was happening in the world, what was going on. Is that irrelevant to the type of, of, of design you're doing that you should have something more historically accurate? Or are you looking to just pair typefaces and understanding what typefaces are in which categories also can tell you what typefaces work well together or what typefaces might have similar features because they're in the same category. So understanding how we categorize type can really help you make intelligent decisions in your design choices. Because we don't wanna end up any of our designs being on the bad list of our type safaris. <laughs> All right. Let me stop recording and we will